Hey, I'm Pavel, and it's a still ongoing story of are you doing networking? And I have to say, even though there's always another story to tell about inter internal kernel changes that are not really visible to the user space, we will be focusing on the networking bits, mostly sticking to the user space and also bits and pieces that should be pretty useful to application writers. So here we go. Um, a unit was created as a generic asynchronous API, not only for storage. And pretty quickly, in a couple of months after the initial release, we've got some basic initial support for send message and receive message operation and request types, which look pretty much like the correspondence calls. If you, if you ignore for a second, are you doing specifics? You pass a socket FD, you pass a struct message header, all the stuff. But there is a difference how we execute it. Well, a Uring is an asynchronous API. The submissions and completions are at least logically separated. And there is also a clear expectation that the submission should not take too long. Well, it should be predictable, it should be brief, it should not block for IO, all the stuff. And on the implementation front, it might be a little bit more tricky. Uh, for lack of proper infrastructure, the easiest way to achieve that would probably be to have a pool of workers. And when you submit a request, you offload the actual execution to a worker thread. This would be slow. And so as an optimization, while trying to submit a request, Inside the submission syscall, we would also try to execute it. But as we cannot block, we would try to execute with some kind of no wait flag. Uh, for networking, it's usually message don't wait, some sort. Well, it might work for sense until it's not. But with receive, there is a, pro a problem. When you do a receive, more often than not, you would usually not have data in the socket. And so th this first execution attempt will fail, and we will still have to upload it to uh, workers, which is pretty slow. And that's why you would usually have some kind of e-poll or polling. And Ayurian also got support for polling around the same time it got support for send message, receive message. It looks a little bit different, but still similar. Uh, it's in the form of pull request. You queue up a, a pull request. It pulls only one file. And when it gets a desired event, it will notify the user space as usual by posting a completion and then terminate the request. So if the user wants to continue pulling the socket, it has to submit a new pull request. Um, yeah. And the asynchronous as it should be. So if you have a bunch of sockets, you can send just a bunch of such requests. Historically, this was the first step for all applications writers who were trying to convert an ePoll application to IU Ring. And unless they have some natural good batching, syscall batching, which means you send a number of IU Ring requests in each syscall, or some kind of completion batching, which is also important, or either they use some more advanced feature or also have block operation on the side in the same IE ring. It's not much to optimize on. And it's most probably they won't get any benefit from using IE ring, which might be pretty discouraging. Uh, and unfortunate, definitely unfortunate for us. Um, in this case, I would probably encourage people for trying to use a ring to be prepared to go de de a little bit deeper. So let's try to think what can be done better. Um, what if we combine IO operation with polling? So as previously, we would try to execute it. But if it fails, we are not offloading into a worker thread. We, we would try to pull the socket. And if the polling tells us that there is data, we will try to execute it again. This 
works much better, and probably the, the best part of it is that it doesn't change the API. You just send in the, uh, send in the request, send message, receive message without any explicit polling. And it definitely much simpler than exposing polling to the user space, but it's not without problems. And just a couple of quick notes on this. Um, as I said before, this receives, when you send a receive, you are most likely to fail the first attempt. It's most likely there is no data in the socket. And this first no wait execution seems wasteful, which most likely it is. And for this reason, we have a poll first flag, which will ignore the first no wait execution and go straight to the polling. Just a little optimization, but pretty useful. For receives. And we also have support for message wait all, some special handling in IO doing. Uh, when we would get a short IO, we would usually just return it right back to the user space. That's unless we have this message wait all flag set. Then we would try to repeat it again, try to go, go back to polling, wait for more data. The, and then try to receive or send more data. So, should be useful. As I said, it's not without problems. Um, one of them is that when you send and receive, you have to specify bu a buffer you are receiving into. And until the request completes, you cannot reuse this buffer. And the whole concept without explicit polling is that you're saying the request, and it keeps sits there for quite a while until it gets some data, right? Um, now, let's say we have a lot of sl slow connections. They might, be, they might be sending a lot of data, but they are bursty and only sends it once per n minutes. And now you have a receive good for, for each of, uh, of those sockets. And each such receive has a buffer backing it. And it all takes memory. Pretty much unnecessary. Well, one solution to this would be just to return the, to explicit polling, right? But we are not looking for the easy ways. Another solution implemented in our Uring is to add a buffer pool into IU Ring. So now, instead of specifying the buffer uh, before sending the receive, you are just setting it to null and telling the request to use the buffer pool. It goes to polling, it waits for data, and only when there is some data, it will grab a buffer from the buffer pool, fill it in, and return to the user space. Uh, in this CQE, it will also return some kind of buffer ID so the user space can distinguish which buffer was used. Uh, yep. As for how to refill the buffer pool, there was actually two versions of it. The first one is kind of unofficially deprecated and because of performance issues. Uh, and it was requiring sending another special type of request. And the second one was to add another ring. Shared between the kernel and the user space, when the user space wants to put a buffer into the buffer pool, it just adds an entry into the string and kernel pulls from it. Um, yeah, a, a mandatory picture for these rings, as it's a ring talk. Um, but this time there is a third ring for this provided buffers. So you just, as usual, you submit a request. When there is some data, it will grab the buffer, as I told before. It will complete and tell the user space which buffer was used. Then the user space can process this buffer somehow and will eventually return, probably will eventually return the buffer into the buffering or allocate some new buffers. This one solves the problem and works for some cases, but let's think what can be done even better. 
and let's just for a bit think how we were doing things before. So back to polling. As I mentioned before, when a poll request gets a desired event, it will terminate the request. We actually can do it a bit differently. We can let it sit in the kernel and it will keep spamming us with completions when they arrive. There are some problems with multi-shot poll at request, but it's definitely an interesting idea because if we combine it with the previous approach of combining I.O. with polling, we can actually have multi-shot I.O. requests. So we've had for a while an accept request, one shot accept request. If we combine it with multi-shot, we can send just one accept request for socket. It will wait for new connections. When a connection arrives, it accepts it, notifies the user space as usual. It keeps seeing the kernel, waiting for new connections, and repeating it again and again. And even more, if we combine it with the buffer pool, we can have a multi-shot receive. This is the same idea. We, we send only one receive per socket. It keeps sitting in the kernel waiting for new data. When data arrives, it grabs a buffer, receives the data, notifies the user space, and then goes pulling again, waiting for new data. So with this one, you have you need only one receive request per connection. And it just keeps running and receiving data. The user page just should be careful uh, refilling the buffers. Well, a couple of notes on multi-shot. Eventually, you want to somehow terminate the multi-shot. You can usually do it with uh, a cancellation operation. Or you can also try to file it in some other way. For example, with sockets, you can shut down the socket and receive multi-shot will be also terminated as well. And the also multi-shot receive also at some cases where it can fail. And the user space should be prepared for it. So one important corner case is that if the buffer pool run, runs out of buffers, it will terminate the pull request. And then the user space should be prepared for it. It should somehow try to refill the, the buffers into the buffer pool. Maybe process completions, maybe allocate more memory, whatnot, and then resubmit the multi-shot receipt. Another condition is coming from the fact that the completion queues are limited. You specify the number of entries in it at the IUU creation time. And if you are trying to post when it's full, it will terminate the multi-shot receive. Well, you are not going to lose the completion. It will be so-called overflown. But the multi-shot request will be terminated, and it's also slow. So the user space should keep an eye on this not happening too often, because, well, the performance will suck. Another note for the user space. We have a feature called fixed files. Uh, it's, it helps us to save on peer request file referencing. It makes much sense to use with it with sense, but there are some problems when we do fixed files with requests which are potentially would not complete or running in an unbound amount of time. So there should be some cautious, cautiousness when we use fixed files with receives, poll, requests, all that. Fortunately for us, we don't even need fixed files for multi-shot requests because the overhead is amortized across the time. So it doesn't really make much performance sense. And we also have a, a bunch of all different requests which you can use. Uh, 
like the ones creating circuits at the bottom, accepting, connecting, creating a circuit. And we also have some requests for closing and shutting down. Um, one warning is that unlike EPOL, all in-flight requests of are you doing will take a file reference. So if you have an in-flight request, for example, like an in-flight receive, and you're trying to close the socket, the connection won't, won't be terminated. And the, the file inside the kernel will still live until the receive completes. So one way would be to cancel all the requests, but you can also shut down the socket, and then the, all the pending requests will be terminated, and so, and so the file will go down together with the connection. Um, just a quick note that Ayurian is still kind of, it's still developing, and it still serves as a kind of sandbox for different ideas and approaches. We have, we already have some zero copy inside uh, for SAN. We also have an RSC out in the mailing list for zero copy receive. It's, it's an ongoing work. And I would say if you are using multi-shot receive, you are already kind of half prepared for the zero copy receives. Um, I think there should be a talk at NetDev, at the next NetDev about this stuff, so. The next thing is a little bit deeper in, in internals, but still important. So I was saying when we get a poll event, we will try to execute uh, the request again. But we are waiting for poll asynchronously. It will wake up us up in the some kind of RQ, soft RQ, or just not really predictable context. We cannot execute requests from there. Even more than that, to execute a request, we need some kind of resources that a task holds, like memory management, MMU setup, all this stuff. So what we would do, we would ask the task that submit, uh, that submit the request to execute it as this request. We were doing it and still doing for default IUing stops uh, via a piece of internal infrastructure called task walk. You might think of it as, let's say, in kernel, internal signal handling. So when you're trying to notify the task about the income of this request that should be executed, if this task was running a syscall, the syscall will be asked to be aborted. Then we will run our request, and probably the user space will retry the syscall. Uh, as you can imagine, it's pretty disruptive, as well as for performance, as well for, as for latency. Another case, if the task was running some user space code at the moment, it will force the task to enter the kernel, switch it into the kernel. We will then execute our stuff and return back. This one expensive and also it prevents us from optimizations. It breaks the completion botching. Uh, yeah, and pretty disruptive as well. So there was a couple of optimizations on top of it. The first one was implemented as a are you doing setup flag cop task run? If you set this flag, instead of the difference would be if the task has this moment running the user space, we are not going to switch it into the kernel. We would wait until it does some syscall and execute it then which kind of assumes that the user space will eventually do a, any kind of syscall, and probably in some reasonable amount of time. It also means that we cannot do from this moment completion queue polling, 
because if you are uh, sitting in the user space and polling for completions, they are not going to arrive magically there. But it has never been a good idea doing that, so yeah. just don't do completion polling, completion queue polling. Another variant of this stuff is deferred task run. So this time, we are not trying to execu execute it after in a nearest syscall. We will execute it only when we are waiting for completions inside the during syscall. The difference is we are not going to interrupt syscalls as, uh, as in this picture. We will be waiting until we are doing the completion queue waiting. It's, it's pretty important for performance. It improves throughput. It definitely saves us from going back and forth between kernel and user space modes, aborting syscalls, causing some troubles aborting some unrelated syscalls. But it was also found out that it's pretty great for latency as well because you would execute because you can be more predictable at what you execute at a time. So for example, if you have if you are trying to do a syscall submitting some request and it will get interrupted just for you to execute some previously sent IO, it might be better to just continue with the submission and then execute the IO when when we are starting to wait. So in this way, the user space gets the full, say, the full control of how it executes IO. And performance is always, it's always difficult. And for you, it pretty much depends on your batching. Uh, the submission batching, how many requests you send at a time with each syscall, this completion batching for not only for how many requests you are waiting for, uh, but also how many completions you actually get per single wait. And the, there are always trade-offs. You can wait for a little bit longer, collect more requests to send, and then send them in a batch but then you lose some of your latency. The same with completions. You can always wait for one and get one completion at a time. Uh, but you, you can probably, it depends on the user space, but you can probably wait for a little bit longer, get more completions, it will be much more efficient. Yeah, so as an example of how it works together in the user space. On a real life example, this one more or less comes from the Foley library, which supports all the latest features of Ayurian. So you would have multiple threads. Each thread will have one Ayurian instance. Uh, it will be their own private instance. We do not want to share the rings because the completion queues and submission queues are not synchronized by the user space. Uh, you do not want to synchronize across them. Uh, there are also a good bunch of optimizations put, put into the single thread model are you doing? And the setup default task run, which I mentioned before, also depends on you using another flag called single issuer, which basically forces the union to work only with one thread. Uh, if you need to communicate between the tasks, you can send communication requests via another type of request called message ring, which allows you to efficiently to paste the data between your instances. And so inside for each you during instance, you will have multiple connections, 
and for each connection you will have just one uh, multi-shot receive queued up, which will be uh, receiving data. Uh, for sense, it, it's usually for sense, it's usually fine to just use the old send message without any additional polling. And I would say that's it. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, you say one uh, you're using instance per process, but when you are using threads, uh, do you use a single instance or, multi or one instance per thread? Sorry? You when your application is using threads, uh, do you run a single instance per thread or uh, yeah. an instance per process? Uh, the recommendation is to use one instance per thread. Okay. Because this way you, sh you will not have any synchronization like spin mm -hmm. logs yeah, across, yeah. you know, rings. Th th that was my concern. <laughs> yeah. And th the other point was um, r for the send MSG. Um, so if I understand well, uh, now you can uh, take a buffer from the pool. Uh, so you ask the kernel to, to bring you a buffer. You write your message in it, you submit it. And once it's completed, uh, you just return the buffer to the kernel. That was my understanding, but maybe it was wrong. And I was wondering uh, if it would not be easier to uh, swap the buffers. I mean, you send a, a buffer containing application data using send MSG, and uh, the kernel just swaps the buffer with uh, one from the pool and mm -hmm. keeps the, the application data, replaces the page in user space so that this one can be uh, reused by the application uh, in place. Yeah. Okay. Not entirely related to this talk. What do you think to these uh, recent patches to disable IOU ring completely, just compile it out? Oh, well. I mean, I, I looked through the bug list. Most of them were for, like, I think it was 5.4. And the thing is, yeah, I admit, there was a lot of bugs, and I usually was developing pretty rapidly. But when I was looking at security bugs, like the last year, they were always for all the kernels, and were not affecting the, the, uh, the current ones just because we've, we've got it much better, the infrastructure, the, all the stuff. And also it would much help if Google also reports of us about bugs, because we, we've already got some stuff, like some people coming and it's like, well, it seems Google closed a bug which they found in kernel, but it's still there. And Nobody from the uh, UU maintainers heard about it at all. Not really nice. How easy is it to use this when what's being transported is TLS or DTLS? Most of the crypto libraries make it hard to plug in, even send them message and, and things like that. You have to, you can provide a callback, but then you have to mem copy the buffer, and it doesn't really lend itself to zero copy in the crypto libraries. I guess it depends on the application, right? Well, in the application with this stuff, you will, well, it will go through the network instead, right? It will still copy inside the kernel, do the copy, because TLS, uh, all that. Uh, you will get it scattered in the user space if you can use the scattered memory. Uh, it, because you get one buffer, you get another buffer, they are not continuous, right? Um, it, might, it will be much more of a problem for zero copy. Yeah, but we'll see. 